Hello, and welcome to Heart, Mind, and Mechanics, the YouTube channel. My name is Wendy Byford, and today I have as my guest, Melissa Swink. Melissa is a time management and delegation consultant, and she is the founder and CEO of a virtual assistant services company. Melissa cut her teeth in corporate America, like a lot of us did, and her specialty was operations and logistics. And since 2012, as an entrepreneur, she's been helping business owners everywhere to uh, maximize their time. And of course, for most of us, time means money. So welcome, Melissa. It's really great to have you here. Thank you so much, Wendy, for having me. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Uh, I, I think that this is going to be a lot of fun. And for those of you who uh, might want to contact Melissa after we're finished, her information will be there for you. So you will be able to get in touch with her. So, Melissa, not everybody yes. understands what a virtual assistant is. So, can you give us kind of the rundown on what a virtual assistant is and what they're not? Sure, absolutely. That's a great place to start because when I started my virtual assistant business in 2012, the concept of a virtual assistant was very, very new. And so, most people looked at me and kind of turned their head like, you mean like Siri, like on, the, like on my iPhone? And I was like, well, not exactly. Um, so a virtual assistant really basically is an outsourced assistant um, who performs their work primarily remotely. Um, so most of the time we're independent contractors. Uh, most of the time we're performing things like more administrative in nature, but virtual assistants can also provide um, support in areas like accounting and social media marketing and things like that. But the great thing about a virtual assistant is that you can usually start pretty small and working with them for only a few hours a week um, and scale up from there until you're getting to that point where you're ready to look at hiring a formal employee. It's a, it's a great way to bridge that gap. Wonderful. And of course, um, if they're an independent contractor, then uh, all you need to do is to make sure that you are not their only client. Correct. And uh, it's always better if they have an entity that they're billing through uh, an LLC or a corporation um, so that the IRS really views them as an independent contractor. So fantastic. Um, typically, what kinds of services can people look to virtual assistants to help them with? Sure, that's a great question. So I like to break it up into some general categories and we'll start with general administrative. So this might be inbox management is a popular one. A lot of us have email overload and it's nice to have somebody um, in our inbox keeping it manageable, especially if we're working on clients, working one-on-one -on -one with clients and we're not on the back end doing all the administrative things behind the scenes. Um, scheduling is another great one. Uh, managing electronic files, uh, maintaining um, CRM systems. There's so many general administrative things that a virtual assistant can perform. Um, and then there's also in the areas of marketing, we can skip over there. Um, many virtual assistants are great at helping out with social media content and management, um, blog posting and writing. Um, email newsletters, um, sales funnels, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then we also have um, virtual assistants that dabble in the area of accounting. So I like to tell people, certainly have a tax accountant that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, I always think that it's good to have several sets of eyes on a set of numbers, but a virtual assistant can be very helpful in terms of like tracking expenses, managing receipts and electronic information, um, reconciling statements at the end of each month, some of those things that you wouldn't necessarily want to pay your CPA to do, but you can have a virtual assistant keeping those on task for you. Actually, that, that's a great idea because we've um, told our, our clients for years that it's really helpful to have receipts and things up in the cloud, and, yep. but not everybody is a natural at organizing that stuff. And so having your VA that can, you know, take all of this stuff and put some order to it so that if you're ever audited, you can actually find what you're looking for is a great yeah. idea. 
Yes, exactly. And another thing that clients love on the accounting side of things is when we do invoicing and bill pay for them as well and following up on past due payments because sometimes that can be an awkward tension in a, a client relationship if they're behind on an invoice or they need to update their payment information. It's nice to sometimes have a third party who's not involved in some of those detailed conversations to be managing that piece for them. So um, virtual assistant, they, the thing is, is that there are so many talented people out there in the world that um, virtual assistants, they, they have such a wide variety of skill sets out there. Right. So what do you need to do before you hire a VA? I'm, I'm sure that you don't just kind of wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want a VA and I'll go out and look for somebody. <laughs> but what kind of preparation um, do you sure. really need to do before uh, you hire somebody so that that person feels comfortable and you feel comfortable? Sure, absolutely. So what I like to talk to potential clients about is what I call my redesign and align process, first of all, is the, the redesign part is most of the time we have clients that start working with us that um, they've built their business up to the point where they are running into the issues with their own capacity, right? There aren't enough hours in the day to get things done. Um, maybe there are things that they want to get done, but they just aren't really quite sure how to do that and are spending a lot of time trying to DIY and figure it out themselves. So I like to take a step back and take a look at really what does your role look need to look like ideally in this next phase of growth for the business. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that falls into the categories of um, sales and marketing strategy, business development, things like that. Mm -hmm. So then what we have is everything else. So the first thing that we take a look at when we've got kind of this everything else category is, are there things that can be eliminated completely, which just don't make sense to continue doing moving forward? Um, so one great example is I was actually doing a strategy session with a client last week, mm -hmm. and she was convinced that she needed a full-time administrative assistant. And I said, well, what are you having that assistant do? And she said, inbox management. And I said, you're going to pay somebody 40 hours a week to manage your email. Yes, I am. Well, when we started digging into it further, we found that probably 90% of the email that she was receiving, she could just either unsubscribe from or turn off notifications or um, uh, direct those messages to other people on her team so that she had very little email in her inbox anyway. And it was down to an extremely manageable level. So she looked at me once we walked through that process. She's like, you just saved me $2,000. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so job. sometimes like taking a look at the big picture of like, do we really need a person doing this? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that we can eliminate completely? The other thing that I like to look at too, when we're talking about aligning the rest of the business to support this newly designed role is, can we also leverage some type of system as opposed to paying a person to do it. So one example um, might be invoicing. Maybe we're gonna upgrade our accounting software so that we can have invoices sent automatically and reminders sent automatically so that we don't have somebody that we're paying by the hour doing manual work. Um, so I like to, I'd like to preface that before we start delegating to other people. So we have all the tasks that are left that can't be systematized, are still important. We need to bring in some outside support or some outside expertise to do. So all that being said, um, from there, I highly recommend creating a job description, just like you would if you were hiring a formal employee. Um, and I like to say that if the job description sounds like a total drag to you, that's probably a really good place to start because um, sometimes I hear clients joke about like, I just need to clone myself. Actually, you probably don't want to do that. You probably want to find somebody who balances you out and is um, skilled in the areas that you're not or has expertise that you're not because you're going to round each other out so, so well. Right. So actually, um, sitting down and writing out a job profile uh, mm -hmm. is, is a really great idea because I think a lot of people, once they're in the process of doing that and really figuring out what they would have this person do, um, they can add in other things that kind of complement that or figure out other ways that uh, they can be more effective by moving some of these other tasks off to somebody else. So that's a great idea. 
Correct. You know, and to, to echo your point, Wendy, when I first started building a team, I worked primarily on my own for about the first six years because I thought that I wanted a business that was small and manageable. And what turned out was that business really managed me. So I really needed to get some outside support, not only just for, for myself as a business owner, but also to support my clients and to enhance the work that I was doing with my clients. And when I wrote out a job description, I realize I'm looking for two different people. I'm looking for somebody who's extremely organized, very analytical. And then I'm also looking for somebody who's highly creative. And we don't always find that in the same person. So then that's when I decided, okay, if I was hiring, I think at the time I was starting out really small, like 10 hours a month. I'm like, I'm going to split this up between two different types of people. And I actually ended up onboarding two people on my team in the beginning, even though that wasn't my initial intention, but by writing out a job description, it helped me get really clear on who I was looking for. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that, that uh, just that process of getting your thoughts together is, is so really helpful. Right. Um, now that people have their job description or their job profile for what it is they're looking for, um, how do they actually find a good virtual assistant? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, that's something that I'm looking for all the time as well as I'm growing my team of where do we find the right people? That's the golden question. Um, And first things first, what I like to do is I like to ask my network. So if you have a networking group that you're a part of or a mastermind group or just any, um, any business connections, starting there and saying, I'm looking for help in this area. Um, Just keeping it really general, like, who do you recommend? Is there somebody that you're working with? Um, Referrals are great. I love to get warm introductions to people. Um, I just feel that it has a higher success rate than um, hiring somebody that you've never talked to before, never, nobody else knows them. You know, it feels like a little bit uncharted territory. So I'd love to ask my network for recommendations. Um, The second thing that I like to do as well is post those job descriptions in appropriate groups on maybe Facebook or LinkedIn. There might There's virtual assistant job boards out there that you can join the group and post a job. Um, I also like to leverage um, colleges and universities mm-hmm. at times when I can post something if they've got a student job board or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, look into there. So really, it's about getting the word out once you first ask your initial network for any recommendations. Okay. And um, what about services? You, you have a VA services company. Um, sure. What's the advantage of going to a VA service company versus, uh, versus trying to do this on your own? Sure, absolutely. That's a great question. So really, when you're so when you hire an individual virtual assistant, or this could go for any service provider, maybe it's a graphic designer, maybe it's a bookkeeper, if that person solely works on their own, um, they're probably highly skilled in, in what they do. So don't get me wrong when I say, you're also putting your eggs all in one basket. So um, what that can look like is you are limited to their specific skill set and also their specific availability. Um, you know, with this year of COVID that we're, we're slowly getting out of, um, you know, suddenly people needed to take leave of absences to care for children or, you know, life happens where sometimes that person might need to take a step away from their business and then their clients. And then you're sitting there with, you know, work on pause, which isn't a great situation to be in if your business is continuing to move forward. So with a team like ours, Um, What we do is I have initial conversations with the potential client to really get into those areas, like what are they looking for help with? And then I have a team where we assign the client to have a lead virtual assistant um, who is their main go-to and manages all their tasks and projects. And then we have other specialized providers on our team, such as graphic designers or bookkeepers, um, copywriters that our lead VAs can pull in to the conversations and to the projects as needed so that we can have that client um, moving forward and not limited to any particular skill set. And the other thing is, too, is that we do a lot of cross training on the team so that if for some reason a client's lead VA needs to take a step back or take a couple of weeks off for whatever reason, we have somebody else that can jump in and keep things moving forward for the client. 
That actually sounds like a really great solution. Um, if you are looking for something that is perhaps a little bit higher skill, so right. that if you're looking for a social media manager, for example, uh, you know, somebody who can design your posts and get them out there and, and do a little bit of strategizing and, and watch, you know, what's coming back from an engagement standpoint, et cetera. It sounds like um, having somebody who's actually part of a team is a really great idea. Correct. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of value there with having multiple sets of eyes on a client's account because other members of the team might even point something out like, hey, did you ever try, ever think of trying to do this? Or, you know, I think this could re work really well here. I've done this with another client of mine. So it's just right. nice to have that team approach mm -hmm. to your support. Great. So now that you've got your, your job profile done and, and you've hired your service or your individual, how do you go about managing your VA so you actually get what you intend, not what yes. they default to? Yes, yes, absolutely. So first things first, um, just kind of kind of twofold, wrapping up our previous um, comments about how to find the right fit, and then also mm -hmm. now how to manage that person. Right. I like to remind people that there is a difference between a good service provider and a great service provider. So a good service yep. provider is going to do the tasks that you ask them to do in, you know, in a decent amount of time, you know, within your deadlines and within your specifications, but they're always looking to you for the next step. What I have found is I like to find great service providers for not only myself, but my team, people who are going to ask the right questions and almost provide insight and some guidance and advice for you to help you and come with answers to the table. So, so keeping that in mind, um, managing a virtual assistant, the number one thing that I recommend, first of all, is having um, some type of task and project management system. So I use Asana with my team. There's a lot of great ones out there, um, but it makes it really, really clear in terms of what are the deliverables and when are they due and who is responsible for them. I think it provides so much clarity um, mm -hmm. for both sides. So not only can the client see where things are at at any time, but then the, um, the virtual assistant can see specifically, these are my tasks and this right. is when the client needs them by. That's really, really helpful for that. Um, I think setting clear deadlines is something that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, again, when I started uh, building my own team, I just kind of gave them a list of things that I needed help with and figured like they go off and they do it and I'd hear back from them in a few days and then things <laughs> would be done. And what I found is like the, the tasks that were less of a priority or less urgent for me were the ones that seemed to get done first. <laughs> so having that project management system is huge. Right. And it also, I mean, if you've got other people on your team that are dependent upon whatever it is that that person is doing, that project management um, software is going to let them know, um, yes. you know, when, when things are coming their way so that they can add in their piece. Yes. Yes, 100%. And another note about onboarding, because I get onboarding questions a lot. Like, we tend to think that we need to have everything packaged up with a pretty bow on it, ready to hand off to an assistant. And I hate to say it, but that never happens. Like, that it, it'll never that that work will never get done. So um, I had a great coach a couple of years ago that said to me, um, you know, I thought that I had to come up with a training manual when I started onboarding my team members. And she's like, no, your team members can create that for you. So they can be creating the documentation or the checklist or the flow chart or what have you mm -hmm. as you're sitting down and training them. So when we're talking about virtual employee, if virtual employees, virtual assistants, uh, virtual service providers, mm -hmm. and we're on a Zoom meeting like this, and we're sharing screens, um, definitely record it so that for future reference, if mm -hmm. that person is doing the work moving forward, if you need to um, reassign work to somebody else, there's always that how-to video in your library. Mm -hmm. And again, that virtual assistant can also document the steps for you as well. And then it's something that they can learn on the go as they're training on the tasks themselves. All right. There's some really good software out there for doing standard operating procedures and adding in videos. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. So, yep. uh, so it sounds like you um, you can actually get the virtual assistant to create that standard operating procedure as Absolutely. you're explaining what to do, and then have them take responsibility for making mm -hmm. the changes. Yes, I would say that would even be some of the first tasks 
really that you assign to them. If you're new to getting any type of help in your business, first things first, we may need to document, these are the tasks that I'm going to be offloading to someone else. And I would like your help in documenting and creating these systems so that we've got this standard for moving forward, whether that person continues doing it or, or you end up kind of promoting them and having them do other tasks, but it's a great place to start when working together. Right. And it's nice to have um, the responsibility for the upgrades given to the people who are dealing with that procedure every day. Right. Um, yes. One, one of the things I found when we, we were building our business um, was that we would all get together and we would do all of the procedures uh, on a regular basis because procedures change. But then Correct. the responsibility yes. for, for each procedure was given to somebody and it was their responsibility to either follow the procedure or make minor adjustments to it and then come back and say, okay, this is what I've done. Correct. Yes, especially because software is always changing and upgrading. And so mm -hmm. this menu over here is now over there and different features change. So yeah. um, that's a good point as well is periodically spot checking and, and making sure that all the processes are up to date and the documentation is where it needs to be. Absolutely. I know how annoying it is sometimes when they say, oh, yeah, just follow this procedure. You go and find that what's on the screen is nothing like what you're seeing. <laughs> yes, we have all been there. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, for, the, um, for our viewers, um, I'd like to walk you through a process that will help you get started. If you don't have a virtual assistant already, then this is a great process to go through to figure out how somebody could help you. So all you need to do is to get out a piece of paper. You can either do this electronically or do it in a written format and write down all of the tasks that you do every day. Now, this will take you some time. And the reason I'm saying that is because when I say all the tasks, I really mean all the tasks. You know, who makes sandwiches for your kids? Who makes your lunch? Um, you know, who cleans your house? All of the tasks that you have in it it's not just business, it's basically your life list. And once you've got every single task um, that you can think of that you possibly do, then go down um, through that list, hopefully it's, you know, just kind of top to bottom, and have a couple of columns uh, on the right hand side. And one of the columns says you and one of the columns says somebody else. And then all you do is you go down through each thing that you've written, and you put down you, so you put a little X beside the, the U or the X in the column for somebody else. Now, here's the challenge. Once you've done that the first time, you go back through it. And for everything that you've put for you, challenge yourself. Do you really have to do that? Because we tend to say, well, you know, I'm the only person in the universe who can do this. I'll give you an example. When we were bu building our company, we built it seven figures, but I held on to a part of that company, which was onboarding our clients. I held on to it for years because I didn't think that anybody other than me or my husband could do that because we asked a lot of questions. We needed to find out a lot of information. And when we were doing that, um, we, there, there were questions, of course, that our clients would ask back and we had to be able to answer those questions. So I didn't think that anybody else could do that, but I couldn't hire somebody to do that. Well, one evening I found myself at 10 o'clock working and it was like, I don't know, it was, it was a bolt that came out of the blue that said, this is going to kill you unless you change this. Mm -hmm. um, because I'd already got to the point where I hated what I was doing just because I was constantly working. Mm -hmm. And I thought there's got to be a way to do this. There has got to be a way to do this. So because, you know, uh, I had to find a way, I finally figured out <clears throat> how to write down everything that I did. I started doing calls and then writing down everything that I said and then making those into scripts and then having uh, frequently asked questions with answers. And then I hired somebody and had her shadow me for a month on every single call that I did. And then we reversed it and I shadowed her for a month. And then I listened, I positioned her so that I could listen to her calls after that and put up my hand to say, let me into the conversation if she was going off track. In the end, she turned out to be brilliant. It worked extremely well. 
So I'm going to challenge you for every little X you have in the U column, make sure that you are the only person who can do that. You are not the only person who can make your children's lunch. You may want to be, but that's different from having to be, right? Mm -hmm. You may be the, you know, you may not be the only person who can make your lunch. You may want to be, but you don't have to be. And so go down that and be really hard on yourself. You know, what, what are the things that only you can do? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, because you are the CEO of your company, you have to set the vision. You have to set the values. You have to do a certain number of things because you are the CEO. But do you have to check your own messages? Yeah, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Right? Do you have to do you have to do your own slides? Mm-hmm. Maybe not. You know? mm-hmm. Do you have to be the person checking the chat in your videos? Yeah, maybe not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. be really, really tough on yourself, and then that will give you the list of things that you can outsource, and then start to group them together mm-hmm. into areas, and you may find that they naturally fall into specific areas. And then, as Melissa was saying. Just say, you know, I want to hire somebody 10 hours a month. Mm-hmm. What, what of these areas can I give to that person to train them and, hand, and have them handle it for me? And that's a really, a really good way to start. Mm-hmm. Now, if you lean into the laws of the universe, as we do in the series, mm-hmm. there is something that um, you probably have seen in Abraham Hicks called the placemat process. And it's a variation on what I just described to you. It's basically taking your to-do list. And yeah, lots of us have had to-do lists that run for pages, right? Right. Yeah. Write down uh, the, the things on your to-do list and then have two columns. You know, what I will do today and what I'm asking the universe to do. And just move things over. The things that you're going to do and the things you're going to ask the universe to do. And the wonderful thing is that the universe can bring you a VA or a VA service right. that can yes. handle a lot of these things. And mm-hmm. so that's one of the solutions that's very, very simple uh, to find. So if either one of those, uh, of those processes works for you, go for it. And I would challenge you to make sure that when you do that, you're really hard on yourself and you aren't taking on more than you really need to. Mm-hmm. Obviously, finances are going to play into it. So, you know, whatever you can afford, if you start small, then you're going to find that with the time that you free up, you can concentrate on building your business. And as you build your business, you'll be able to transfer more things over to somebody else. Right. So good way to get started. Yes. So Melissa, do you have any um, last words for us? (laughs) Um, you know just echoing with your exercise that you so eloquently described the placement exercise that the universe has given us you know virtual assistance and and I just want to reiterate that I have learned you know over the last few years of leading a virtual assistant team and and having other people support me and my clients there are so many wonderfully talented people out there who would love to help you grow your business. And so sometimes it's a matter of just getting out of our own way and allowing other people to support us and to work with us and to serve us and using their, um, this work, doing the work that they were meant to do in this world as well. So I've just found that it's been very rewarding to, um, you know, as I've been blessed with a growing business to be able to also bless others in the form of hiring them to to do work for myself and my company. It's just been a very rewarding journey on that front as well. And I know that they, um, you know, there are service providers out there all around the world that um, want to be put to work and want to want to be able to serve clients in the areas that they need. So um, I think that is just a beautiful opportunity. Outsourcing isn't, isn't, um, is, it sounds very simple, but there, there's definitely a ripple effect of benefits for, for both sides involved in the equation. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I've, I've used virtual assistants myself, and it is, um, it's, it's really wonderful to have people that are talented and can take over an area for you. Right. Uh, don't, um, don't give up your power and authority, make sure that you monitor what's going on, because you get what you inspect, not necessarily what you expect. 
right. right. Not because yeah. these people are trying to to do something wrong, but simply because they may not understand what it is that you want the first time around. They may not uh, understand how important it is to you or what your time frame is. So there's going to be some tweaking. So make sure that you inspect what's going on. Make sure that uh, they feel comfortable coming to you with questions so that they can get it right because right. they're professionals. They want to do a great job for you. And right. So- Yes. Yes. And Open communication is huge. It, it is. Make sure that, yeah. that they feel comfortable um, asking those questions and that every time they come, you're not judging them. You're there to help them to be the best that they can be because yeah. they're going to do their best work for you. Right. So, yes. And make sure that you get your, um, your statement of work if you're using services or the individual so that you know exactly what the person's going to provide and there's no surprises at the end. Yes. Contracts are very, very important. Contracts, working agreements. It just, it just clarifies the boundaries and what your responsibilities are, what their responsibilities are. And it's just all spelled out. Um, You know, in the times that I have hired that, that friend of a friend for a couple of hours here or there and just kind of had a loose agreement, those never work out well. No. Not, well, not for either side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if you've got any questions, um, please make sure that you post them and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Yes. Okay. Yes. This yes. is the end of this interview. Thank you so much, Melissa. I do appreciate your being here very Thank much. Thank you. Yes, it was a, such a pleasure, Wendy, and I hope that all of this information was beneficial. Right. And if you want to get hold of Melissa and invest, uh, investigate further the, the types of services that her business provides, then her information uh, will be available for you um, below this video, and you are welcome to, to contact her. Wonderful. Okay, Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome back. Hope you got a lot of really great information from that video. Now before you leave, there are two things that I'd like you to do. The first is subscribe to this channel and make sure that you get all of the really great information that we're going to have coming to you in the months ahead. Now, the second thing is to go to www.wendybyford.com and when you do that, you're going to land on this page. You're going to be invited to watch a video called the five things that you need to know before you start your business. Now, if you've already started your business, no problem. I just go through five questions that you really need to answer in order to build the business that you'll love. However, more importantly, when you put in your name, your first name, your last name, and your email address, it's going to take you over to an opportunity to sign up for a discovery call so that you can find out if learning more about the universal laws is going to help you to accelerate the growth in your business and in your life. So go to www.wendybyford.com, watch the video if you would like, but more importantly, click on that button to say, yes, I wanna book my call and let's have a conversation. Oh, and before you go, remember to subscribe to the channel.